Hi there. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Tracy Marshall. Welcome to Guild Hall. I am um, co-producing this series. This is the second one in a series of three that we really thought this year, uh, well, the Hamptons, oh, sorry, guys. <laughs> I didn't know you were coming out right behind me. Hi, this is great to have friends on stage with me. So let me, <laughs> I'm just going to go a little bit into the Hamptons Institute, and then I'll introduce my great panel here. Um, the Hamptons Institute was started about nine years ago um, with the idea that out here in the summer, um, there are enough parties and enough wonderful beach time that sometimes we need to feed our brains. And so to capitalize on all the great um, talent and, uh, and in intelligent people out here, uh, the programming was formed. We took a little break, and now we've been back for the last three years uh, with topics ranging everything from the... Um, from the climate change, fake news, the future of the Supreme Court, et cetera. Some of them a bit more heady. And this year, we decided to really concentrate on things that have direct, um, direct impact on the East End as well as, as, uh, as, the, as America and the world. And so we started off last week with a great discussion on, the, on plastics pollution, obviously really important out here. And this week, Me Too, um, and how the communities are really accountable, that across America we really have to be accountable. This conversation is real, it's not going away, and it will not continue unless we all take personal responsibility and accountability for making sure that we talk about this until we don't talk, have to talk about it anymore, uh, that, it's, that, it, that it really is, is resolved. So that's why we are wonderful panelists are here tonight. And then next weekend we're gonna talk, or next Monday we'll talk about the opioid epidemic, um, also very important out here and sadly uh, becoming more and more of, more of a problem. So we'll address that next week. But without further ado, this week <laughs> we have a great panel. Um, to my far left over here we have, uh, we have Tora uh, Bontrager. She was raised Amish and is the author of, <clears throat> she is an author and uh, sexual assault survivor. Tora escaped uh, the Amish community at age 15. She, is re she recently founded the nonprofit, a nonprofit, the Amish Heritage Foundation, which advocates for the rights of women and children and, educa and educates on Amish issues. And she'll get into a lot more about her work. It's fascinating. Um, in the middle, brave man here, <laughs> Don McPherson. He's an activist, feminist, former NFL quarterback, and, uh, co and college hall of famer and has been doing work in the space around um, masculinity issues uh, for 24 years, Don. So this is Don. And last but not least, um, Nancy Schwartzman is a documentary filmmaker and long-term activist on gender-based violence. Uh, she has a new film called Roll Tide Roll. It premiered at Tribeca um, just recently and has uh, collected a couple of awards recently, including the Adrian Shelley Award in, uh, for Excellence in Filmmaking and also the Monmouth County Film Festival Award. So we're looking forward to seeing a little clip uh, on the film in a bit. Um, so she's also uh, part of Joe Biden's Council on Violence Against Women and the creator of, a, the, of the Circle of Six app, which she'll tell you about more in a little bit. But without further ado, let's, let's get going. <laughs> oh, I, didn't give my notes here. I thought we'd start with sort of, uh, as we were talking about this, is, this is uh, an issue that affects every single person in this room and our communities on a daily basis. Um, we can't open the newspaper or, God, that was so old school. We, <laughs> we can't look at the news or, or turn on the television uh, or look at the internet without seeing yet another uh, example uh, out there of somebody being accused of, um, of sexual abuse. Um, and, and, it's, and, and it is happening not only in the press. I mean, this was, was precipitated, I think, the Me Too movement last October with, uh, with the, the Weinstein case. But really, I think this all started um, <laughs> the year before, um, around the time of the election, when women really could not, uh, could, at least me personally, I'll speak for myself, um, was outraged that uh, we, have, we have elected someone who um, has been accused of and, and uh, certainly gotten away with, uh, with, with 
with bad, <laughs> bad, bad situation, I'm sorry. And so, and so the toothpaste is now out of the tube. Here we are, we're going, the rocket ship has launched. We have to, we have to can, the momentum of these, of, of these high profile cases has allowed the voices to be heard and now we have to continue the conversation in our communities and amongst ourselves and our families and tonight's really gonna be about about that and how it is that we can we can keep this conversation keep the conversation going um, and, and and come up with solutions within our communities. So, what is for each of you? I'm going to ask you, what is it that you're doing in your work now that is keeping you up at night? That is that is sort of top of mind around around this particular space. I'm going to start with you. Sure, I'll start. What keeps me up at night is how to inspire women and girls to take back their voices and to know that they're not alone. And along with that, um, specifically those from closed, so closed societies who are suffering from trauma. And um, to advance that a little bit more, I, I would love for them to be empowered to, on a local and global and national level, to have a seat. Um, at the table of world leadership, I feel that's so important. Small, <laughs> small goals there, my <laughs> goodness. Don? Um, we are at a, at a point, I, I think it's important to, as, as a man here, to talk about how um, I got involved in this work. It was the recognition and understanding several years ago uh, from a, a man named Jackson Katz that this is a men's issue, that overwhelmingly all forms of men's violence against women is committed by men and boys. If we're going to solve the problem, men have to be a part of the conversation. And we have to address the culture of sexism and misogyny that leads to the attitudes that lead to the behavior in the first place. And, sure. and we're at a, a sort of an inflection point now with Me Too because men aren't sitting around during the Me Too moment and thinking, oh my goodness, all these women who are coming forward, all these marches that are going on, I better go home and check my patriarchy and go home and talk, talk, talk with other men about the misogyny and the patriarchy that's governed our lives. And so we're not having that conversation as men. And so we have to reframe um, the way that we approach men in a way that includes men in the conversation about healthy and whole masculinity for our sons and boys so that we're raising the next generation of men to not even tolerate the foundations of men's violence against women. Right, which is the community and, and starting with, with education and, and, and not letting them get to the point where they perpetrate. And lastly, Nancy. Um, great, well thanks, thanks for having us here. It's really nice to be here. Um, you know, I'm a filmmaker and a storyteller and a technologist, um, and I'm also an activist because I make my work from, you know, an, originally as a filmmaker from a personal place. Um, and my first film um, really investigated my own sexual assault, and I that central question of like, why did this happen? Why did this happen? I realized in that process, and this is way before Me Too. This is during the dark. Bush years where there was no sex education at all and Paris Hilton was like my sex educator, you know what I mean? Like it was like we knew a lot about her private parts and it was like, whoa, that's on Time Magazine cover. Like it was such a weird time around sexuality um, and no one was having these conversations and really the core of what I wanted to understand was like why did this happen and I realized the only person I can ask that question of although you were in my film, Don had an awesome line, which I will say now, which was, we raise women to survive in a rape culture, and we do nothing to talk to men and boys about not raping. And you said that in my movie like 10 years ago, and it was people still, like their minds can't process that wisdom, right? And it's so simple and, and obvious, but I realized in that early film, like the only person I could ask why this happened was the person who assaulted me. No one's gonna give me that answer. There's no, nothing I did to make that happen, right? So in my filmmaking journey, um, I wanted to look at perpetrators, right? Like, where can I find young boys talking openly or, or men talking openly about why they're doing it? And what I found was the Steubenville, Ohio story, which was um, one of the first, probably the first story to go viral about this because it was... 2012, social media was just blowing up. Kids were naive enough to think their tweets were private. So they're tweeting away like their text messages and suddenly you can just see 
whole dialogues about people talking really openly about rape and perpetration. So that was a really long journey. We, we premiered at Tribeca. Um, so I'll show you guys a bit about it, and it looks at a small town in the Rust Belt, a football team. But, but really, that community could be anywhere. It could be an elite private school. It could be a hockey team in Canada. It could be, you know, all these different ways that certain kids are privileged over others. Um, and how that can like go wrong. So we're gonna roll that yeah, now, and it really is the clip. perfect kicking off for yeah. a community a conversation about community accountability. So. to get these kids guilty. And even if they're guilty of rape, that they didn't do this and that, I hope, you know, that the truth comes out. When I first read this story, there wasn't a lot of substance to the article. Two high school football players had been charged just a couple of paragraphs about these two boys, and that was it. I thought, this is nuts because that town is so entrenched in their football team. This is big news. So that's when I started snooping around. I had never seen a case constructed like this. That many people who have some information. This was a sexual assault with teenagers, and the cell phones told the story. We had photos. We had 400,000 text messages. It was on Twitter, actually. Song of the night, rape me. Some people deserve to be peed on. Just the complete lack of empathy, that was what was so frightening. I mean, it was all out there. You're always gonna get two very different sides, but this was just at another level. We didn't know exactly what happened, but we knew there was a lot of defensiveness about it. Uh, I just didn't understand it at all, I, because I don't think it's something that doesn't occur in other cities and states and counties all over. If teachers knew about it, if coaches knew about it, if a principal knew about it, if parents knew about it, why was nothing done about that? And the question was, is this football town, you know, putting its daughters at risk by protecting its sons in a situation like this? Wow. Thank you so much, Nancy, sure. for sharing that. It was, it's, it's a perfect jumping off point for the, for the remainder of our conversation. And, and certainly, speaking to your, your expertise, Don, um, Nancy, when, when you first enter, went to Steubenville, uh, what was, how long did it take? What was it like to try to penetrate the, the, the town and get, get some answers? I mean, were they? Um, it was not easy. Um, I made sure to rent a car that was not had a didn't have a New York license plate. Um, it's a very you know the the international media really swooped down on this town, and already the town was not doing good about wanting to be transparent. There were a lot of women and men who were upset by the story, but because it's such a small community, they felt like if they spoke out, there would be repercussions. Like, they could lose their job, they would be shunned. You know, there's this thing of like, every, you know, they got so defensive that if you tried to say, I care about what happened to this girl, and rape is bad, um, they read that as you were critiquing their town and trying to destroy their football team. So I think there just wasn't, there wasn't education or space for people to even begin to have this conversation without throwing the victim under the bus. And that's what like 
first and foremost, really needs to change. Um, but I wanted to say that I also constructed this film to really play like a true crime thriller right. with a lot of football and kind of with an aggressive, fast-paced energy because I wanted it to be for men and boys. Like that's the audience I wanted to craft it for. Um, so it's not victim-centered at all. And actually the film really just focuses on the community that enabled and the teens. So they were defensive of outsiders. And I also think so few of us in communities are equipped to actually have these conversations. Um, so they're not different than probably towns all over the United States. Well, this is my thought, is that it's got to be completely indicative of that. And that really also brings me to, to Tora, who your work is really around um, getting to communities that are closed. And one of the most closed communities one can think of is, is where you come from. And tell us about your experience trying to, to infiltrate and, and get back into and educate um, within your communities? Sure, so uh, inside the Amish community, there's no such thing as sex education. So I grew up, I, I didn't understand anything about my body. The only thing I did understand was that it's taboo. Um, there's all the shame associated with it. And um, how that plays out inside um, not only the Amish, but a lot of other closed communities, is that uh, rape culture runs rampant. And uh, the worst part, aspect about it for us, from my background, is that if a woman uh, who's a baptized member of the church uh, is raped, she has to go in front of all the other members of the church and ask the rapist for forgiveness for having tempted him. But, but isn't that sort of how we, as a society, I mean, we, we do, there, there, is an, there is an underlying feeling of how that's how we treat women, that they are... The, 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 the gasp, I understand people's gasp because that sounds so um, disgusting and, 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 and just hu humanly egregious. However, that is our culture. There is no, you talk about no sex education in, in the Amish. I, I ask this question of audiences all the time of, of college students. How many people in here got a graphic, honest, and, and sustained conversation from the people that raised you and taught you to be a healthy and whole person, say, yes, ma'am, please, sir, from those people? How many got a graphic, honest, and, and sustained conversation about your bodies and intimacy and sexual behavior and how we are with each other? How many people? I know it's dark and I see one hand, possibly, two hands, three okay. hands. So the question is for the rest of you, where'd you learn it? The streets, and I will tell you that the streets now, for our boys in particular, is pornography on this. It is graphic, it is dehumanizing, it is grossly, violently misogynistic, and so, and when women are sexually assaulted, we do almost the same thing. And we expect that the culture, that, that the culture is gonna apologize uh, for that man's behavior. Right, it's victim blaming exactly. in mainstream society. That's the equivalent. Yes. And also, I remember when, in the international context, when um, you know we were going to help Afghanistan or whatever, um, and it was like there was this outcry that you needed an eyewitness to prove a rape in Afghanistan. Oh my God, you need an eyewitness? Um, welcome to the U.S. criminal justice system. I mean, it is supposed in this in the Steuben Mill case, the prosecutor says in a normal case, it's the victim's word is enough to be believed. And then she just leaves this kind of big pause because like, we know that's not how things shake out. And actually in that case, they needed eyewitnesses to get convictions. And that's what's so egregious about student bill is that there were multiple eyewitnesses that didn't do anything. And that's what enabled a guilty conviction. But for us to be outraged that in Afghanistan, a woman goes forth and has to find other people who saw it, that's how our system Yes. Exactly. Right. I, I, I just want to. I just want to say one thing about the. the I, I don't want to. I think we do need to talk about education and where we go next. I think it's critically important. However, my father was a police officer in New York City for the 40 years before he retired, and DNA evidence. When DNA evidence was all of a sudden discovered, that was the hit, right? We had DNA. And I'm just gonna tell you that you can get, like, again, with, with the film, and we can think about how this is an emerging conversation because of Me Too. Some of you may remember a guy named Jameis Winston. He plays for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers right now. Jameis Winston won the Heisman Trophy, the most celebrated single award in almost all the world because of how we celebrate college football in this country. Jameis Winston won the Heisman Trophy, and we knew his DNA was in a rape kit. 
We knew that. And he was celebrated as one of the greatest young athletes in our country. That was only a couple of years ago. That was one of the things I wanted to mention was uh, in terms of uh, the backlog rape kits. That's one thing. We have the evidence. But then for people like me who weren't able to even talk about what happened until many years later, the, it, it, the system protects the attackers. The system, the criminal justice system does not believe me over the attacker. They're protecting the attacker, and I can't provide DNA evidence. There's no one else who saw what happened, uh, and it's by design. You can't continue to get away with um, repeat assaults if you let other people see it, usually, except in certain contexts, um, like your film. So, yeah, it's how do we, how do we end the culture when this is the situation? Right, Nancy. I know you. <laughs> I know you. You also have your own personal story and how you. I mean, if 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 the criminal justice system is not helping you, then how does one actually get the help they need? If you feel that that is that's disempowering, what what are we doing within our communities, and what should we be providing within our communities that does actually help and empower victims to actually? Call some call for some sort of justice, and I I don't know whether you want to comment, Nancy, on um, sort of part of your journey. Sure, I also want to hear how Tora broke her silence. If you would share that. Sure. Yeah. Uh, the question is, how did I break my silence? Uh, thanks for asking. <laughs> so I was raped repeatedly by two of my uncles over the course of the first year after my escape at age 15. So the first half year I spent with an uncle in Montana. Within a month, he was raping me, and after the first night, he told me, if you ever tell anyone, I'll kill you. That bought my silence. And that was through 13 years. It took me 13 years until I had the courage to uh, say what happened. But just to sort of back up a little bit, I had to figure out how to escape him after Going the first half question. year. Exactly, to not um, make him feel like I'll report him. I had to figure out how to do that, which I did. And I went to my other uncle in Wisconsin, and both of these uncles had also uh, left the Amish church as kids. So I went to the Wisconsin uncle who was married, had some kids. Uh, I thought I was safe. First time his wife goes on an, on an overnight business trip, he does the same thing. So I, I still, I can't report him. I don't know where to go. And it takes me the rest of that semester I was in school. I had to stay in school um, or I'd get sent back to my parents. So I was in a bad situation. So fast forward 13 years later, I always knew that I would talk about this in a book, that it would be my memoir. And I released that last year, early last year, and despite working on it for two and a half years uh, and sorting through, you know, this threat, I mean, this threat really had a hold on me. I, I was scared. And I won't, I'll never forget just that moment of pressing the button, you know, should this publish? And it was that fear. And again, this is before Me Too. Me Too took off October of 2017. My book came out in, in early um, 2017. And I started a podcast that was part of my way of addressing it. And I can go into that later. But that, yeah, it was just something I had to do and I wanted other women and girls to know that this is not okay and to speak out and know that they're not alone and go ahead sorry sure no that's an like amazing story and it's always when you hear it's, it's like you know we're all pushing forward doing work I'm sure folks in this audience do amazing work every day and you're just like no we're doing the work we're doing the activism and then when you just like stop for a second and think of the years and years it took for us, you, me, whoever, to like just recover. And then you do really see it as like a weapon, right? It's like, oh, men's violence against women is like 
a weapon because imagine, sometimes I think, well, wow, what would I be doing if I hadn't you know, spent five years making my first film, investigating my own rape and being vocal about it and inspiring lots of people to speak about it. You know, it's, it is about helping, but it is also just amazing. What would it be like if this hadn't happened and I didn't have to negotiate through it to then become who I am now? You know, um, yeah. But what, what was your question? Well, I, I, well, actually, the thread uh, here is that so so Tori, you have your um, your podcast, um, and so I'm I'm, I'm the, the idea of giving a voice really is I, I think part of what we're we're talking about here that provides the opportunity for people to speak out, and the more that when you shared your story and you're both sharing these stories well before it was a Me Too moment. Um, do you find that uh, they 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 find the stories find you? Your for tell tell everybody about what you're doing in your project, which is fascinating with uh, documentation. Sure. So I realized that I could keep my memoir in the news for quite a bit, but at the end of the day, people are still going to say, "Oh, it's an isolated incident." So I came up with the idea for this podcast, and I, I envision releasing a new story of a sexual assault survivor every week. I felt that uh, if that happened, then no one would be able to deny it anymore. You know, it's not just me saying this, and it's not just once a year or who knows how long. It's every week. And even though I was looking specifically for Amish survivors, I wanted anybody and everybody to demonstrate that this does not discriminate. I mean, this happens in all sectors of society and all over the globe. And um, even though I haven't released a new story every week, <laughs> the Me Too movement came along. And I feel, you know, that was kind of enough of us who have been working behind the scenes for so long that all of a sudden something triggered and um, took a hold and just kept moving. Sure. And the, and the idea of these, especially the marginalized societies are, that are living in, in places where the Me Too movement is, it's, uh, you know, it's in the news, but it really certainly hasn't, is not universal. And so the efforts to try to make sure that the small towns, I mean, as you were mentioning, Steubenville certainly doesn't, is not opening their arms and, and other small places where, where your stories and, and the stories that you're telling and the work that you're doing can em empower people to, to support each other. What specifically um, are, should some of, the, should communities be doing to, to um, certainly um, support what is not happening through our federal government and, and all the cuts which Nancy can speak to, but um, what, what should they be doing in order to support the work that, work that you are already doing? I just wanted to say something. Um, you know, there's a, a line in the film where it's like, you know, if there's a group that's really important to your town or your team, or they're the funders, or they're the religious leaders or they're the coach it, you know, it's like, where can we all look in, in terms of like who gets away with stuff and who doesn't? Who's labeled the good kids and who's labeled the bad kids? And when we have those kinds of labels, then we can't see past, no, but this is a good kid. He's like our quarterback and he's middle class and he's like, you know, he's a white kid that they don't do that. You know, that, that was part of the narrative that was going on in this town. And you're looking at like who gets privileged and then who gets silenced and like how, you know, in my initial story in my first film, I was sexually assaulted abroad and I thought, oh, I'm going to get home to New York. Everyone's going to understand. And like, I'm not going to face what I faced where I was. I was living in the Middle East and I get home to New York and like, wow, there was so much victim blaming, so much misinformation. So I think we all think, oh, well, I, you know, in my Ivy League school, they're going to have a really evolved perspective on this, right? We both went to Columbia where... Well, you know, <laughs> they have a lot of problems. You know, but you just, you make these assumptions. I think we all do. I mean, I certainly did. Like, well, my community is like woke and smart about this stuff. And then you have conversations that are just shocking, right? Like there's so much kind of misinformation or, um, you know, desire to hold up the status quo a bit that, um, yeah. And protection. Don, I know you're doing some work at the moment at uh, Syracuse. Well, a lot of the work that I do is, is in and around higher education on this issue. And um, I think there's a, 
a point about this conversation that we have to engage men and boys in this, in this conversation. And we have to do so in a way that is sustainable, and very often the dialogue that's going on right now is not a dialogue where, as I said before, men are thinking that we wanna be in, involved in the conversation. So we have to look at um, how are we gonna get men engaged and for what reasons? <laughs> and sometimes it might not always be the reason that we all think it should be. Uh, and then what do we, how do we engage them? And so one of the things, if, if you follow sort of even before Me Too, um, was the Dear Colleague letter that came out of the, um, the, uh, Andrea Pino and, and Annie Clark, two students at, at uh, North Carolina who used Title IX to um, force their institution to address their sexual assault at North Carolina. What's happened in higher ed over the past couple of years is that women's voices have been heard and the voices of victims have been heard, uh, but men still are not engaged. And so what's happening now in higher ed, which is similar to the Harvey Weinstein and Bill Cosby outside of higher education, is I refer to as the billion dollar problem. If you take Baylor University, Penn State University, and Michigan State University, those three institutions over the past couple of years, several years, because of men's silence primarily about predatory male behavior, predatory sexual male behavior, those three institutions are on, have, have paid out or will pay out more than a billion dollars. And at Baylor, that's over 220 million currently, and those numbers come from January of 17, Baylor has yet to start paying claims on 52 outstanding rape cases. And so when you look at the billion dollar problem, we are at the tip of the spear in so many ways as men, and in higher education, okay, now what do you do? What is your role as an academic institution, as an educational institution, to address this issue? And that's when we have to talk to men in a very different way than we have in the past. Great, yeah. Agreed, and and so what are what are what are you doing? I mean, this is how, how are you speaking to them, and what is uh, you, you must have colleagues in the field that are doing it, or is it not? I mean, this is. I you know one of the things that and and men like myself came to this work, and I mentioned Jackson Katz, who was my mentor. But really, in reality, men came to this work because women invited us into the space. And women said, if you're going to be an ally, if you're going to be in this work, we don't need more police. We, don't, we need men to go talk to other men. Mm -hmm. And so essentially what I've been doing my, most of my career is at the, at, the, at the behest of women, I've been using my privilege as an athlete um, to go in and talk to men about dismantling that which gives us privilege, which is a very tricky thing to do. And so one of the things that, that's happened as a result is that we have, listening to women and being accountable to women, we have been talking to men about things like toxic masculinity and redefining men. Well, that's not a really a positive conversation to men to engage. I imagine the audience, again, with the lights I can't really see, is predominantly white people, right? Can you imagine if I walked in and said, you need to deal with your toxic whiteness? Right? We need to define what it means to be white, to engage you in a conversation uh, about racial injustice. And so it's not going to ha happen that way. And, so we, and the other thing is that because we're in this moment now with Me Too and, and Time's Up and, 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 and Title IX and all that on college campuses, men know that we're coming in to talk to them because of what happened to women. And so men are saying, well, the only reason you're here to talk to me about masculinity and healthy masculinity is because you're trying to prevent violence against women. And so the conversation has been further distanced from healthy and whole masculinity. I would say we don't raise boys to be men, we raise boys not to be women or gay men. And so we don't give boys a framework of what healthy whole masculinity looks like. Right. And so one of the ways in which we need to talk to men is have a com and having a conversation in an educational apparatus that talks to men independent of the issue of men's violence against women and really talks to it because it's the same fundamental, as I said earlier, the same fundamental um, attitudes that, that lead to whole and healthy masculinity are the same ones that we need to teach in the prevention of men's violence against women. Sure, absolutely. And it makes me think about the things that I hear when I talk to, when I talk to people in, in terms of, I'm sure it's a challenge speaking to men because there's the, the defensive nature of the conversation, right? And one of those things is, well, geez, you know, all of these things, all of all the things that are coming out from the horrible Weinstein down to um, sexual harassment in the workplace, um, and this fear that we are painting it all with one brush, and that all of these men are painted with the with the same brush. And I, I posed this to 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 the group earlier, and and Tori, you so well defined sort of what what the boundaries are, and uh, please tell us. <laughs> Share so in, in terms of uh, sexual assault, yes. harassment, yes. There, there's a range. The range, yeah. Yes, there's a range. So there's a very clear box where this is rape. Outside of that, how, how are we to navigate? What, what, what is acceptable? What isn't? What is um, coming out of simply just 
not, no awareness, it's ignorance, it's not ill-intentioned versus those, the range that is. And that's where sex education comes in. It's and in the, then- ex Exactly, it's from the microaggression, you know, to, to rape, which is, and it is a huge range. And, and, and without the tools, I mean, if you're not learning this at home or in your community, where, where are we learning it? Um, so. Or in your school. Or in your school. Which was, you know, we were talking about this. There's oftentimes a lot of pressure on parents who need to do better and know more. And a lot of times teenagers are right. running wild and people are like, well, where are the parents? And certainly parents have a part to play, obviously, in doing this work. But they're not sex educators. They're not public health um, professionals, necessarily. So in Holland, they have incredible sex ed designed by public health educators that's feminist and consent based and that is blanketed through the schools like we don't have that i mean how many people had sex ed in their schools it's hard to see you can see some like seven nine <laughs> and that's not even asking if it was like good and thorough and sex positive and didn't make you feel ashamed for you know being a woman or engaging in sexual behavior you know so it's like there's all this pressure that we have to learn it at home but I, I got some very weird sex ed from my mom, who's a lawyer, who was like, you can do whatever you want when you're 18. That was like it. Yeah, same, a similar thing. You know, I, I Are remember, you having sex? I remember a, a, a woman at a conference many, many years ago, and I stole this line from her because she talked about, I always talk about how prevention language and scare tactics don't work when we're trying to talk to young people. And we use prevention language and scare tactics because we're uncomfortable with the reality of our, of our lives. And this, I heard a woman say that we tell, we tell young people that sex is dirty, immoral, it's going to cause unwanted pregnancies and STIs, but save it for the one you love. <laughs> Right, yeah. and, and, and just if you think about that, and as adults, we feel like we've given. You know, meanwhile, as I said before, they are exposed to so much that we can't even talk yeah. about. Parents not being aware, we're uncomfortable even if we see it, and to them it becomes normal. And in many ways, children start to almost protect their parents. Bless you, yeah. protect their parents from what they know. Yeah. Right? You no, know, my, my my mom couldn't handle this. My dad would be so upset if he knew this. Right? And so they they're to so much, and yet we're still afraid to talk to them honestly about the reality of, the, of these issues. So, sure, Tora, with, with your work, I mean, obviously there's so many boundaries, but I mean, are you making headway and getting to speak to people within the communities um, and, and talk about a baseline? I mean, to have zero information, um, to, to actually trying to engage with them in a way that is helpful. What, what are some of the things that you're finding in your, in your um, interactions? So there's a, a portion, a percentage of Amish who have escaped or left or resigned from the church. And thanks to Facebook opening up to the public, that's when I began to be able to connect with, with them. And what I'm doing now through the nonprofit work is to create support groups online on Facebook and to host monthly sexual assault survivor advocacy meetings um, that they can connect to uh, via video online to create a safe space and to just talk about what, what healthy sex is, positive sex, what's acceptable, what isn't. And uh, right now, I'm not reaching those inside the church. You know, that's the big challenge. But I feel uh, like I've made a lot of progress just to have collected some stories uh, for the podcast and to sure. also be finding uh, people who are coming to the groups online and they're wanting the, that non-sectarian welcoming sure. Um, space. Sure. Tell us about Circle of Six. Sure. Um, so, a long time ago, we had an administration that cared about women and girls, um, and the land they, far, far away. and <laughs> technology, actually, because um, it was basically the Office on Science and Tech was this kind of dusty, kind of nerdy, uh, well, did you guys watch Veep? Yes. It's like the best show ever. But actually, it's, it's almost like a documentary, the way it's, the way those offices look, but um, OSTP was sort of... Um, like that, and then under Obama and Biden, they brought in a chief technology officer, um, Anish Chopra, who's just this brilliant, brilliant, um, 
you know, tech innovator who also was really excited about what citizens could bring to problems. And um, the CTO, so it was the first time the US government had a CTO, um, teamed up with uh, Biden, who was the initial author of the Violence Against Women Act in 92. And what they had seen over the years was like uh, violent, uh, violence against women was decreasing in a lot of sectors, um, but not the college sector. And now obviously we all know that campus assault is a huge issue and that's primarily in part to student activists, but also that the federal government was putting so much attention on this 18 to 24 um, year chunk of kids, right, who's going away to college, who suddenly has no rules and no, no parents and alcohol and uh, no sex ed, and it was just this pressure cooker for violence. So um, they decided to put forth a challenge um, to see if we could build a mobile app um, that address violence against women and could reduce the numbers in that bracket. So um, from my first experience with my first film, The Line, I had spent a lot of time with young people talking about consent, healthy sexuality, and I learned so much from them in, in talkbacks after the film about where they were experiencing violence, how they were experiencing violence, what they could have used on the ground, what they sort of needed. So when this challenge was um, put forth, it was like build an app, see if you can win the prize. Um, I was, my first thought was like, I can't build an app. I'm a filmmaker. Like, I don't, I don't know what to do. Um, then I built a team and, you know, taking from what I had learned, we created a tool called Circle of Six, which is really, really simple. Um, you, you put in six people. It's, it's basically a harm reduction tool, which is meeting people where they are. Oh, it's 4 a.m. on a Saturday night and you need to figure out how to get home. Well, you've already put six people you trust into your circle. You've already alerted them they're in the circle. They know about it. You've had a, a low key conversation about like, hey, can you have my back? Like if I'm out. So it's sort of, I don't love this term, but it's sort of the buddy system. It's things that, young women have done forever when we go out clubbing, when we're on spring break, when we're like, don't leave without me, where are my people? So you don't have to figure this out at three in the morning and you've already had these conversations. And the other piece about it is because you can bring six people in, a lot of guys are part of people's circles. So suddenly men who are starting to recognize, okay, this is a problem, my girlfriend's an assault survivor, my dorm mate, you know, I don't know what to do, what can I do? So the tool encourages you to A, get informed, like here's some links, like how to listen to a survivor, where to send a survivor. Don't be the white knight showing up with the baseball bat saying I'm gonna kick his ass, like that might not be useful. Why don't you say, what do you need? You know, so there was this, and because it was technology, there was this very low key way that the information got disseminated. It wasn't politicized, it wasn't um, feminist, right? It was actually just useful because it's a tech tool. So I've, you know, we've had military bases adopt it. We've had a lot of Republican support for it because it's just a simple, beautifully designed um, <laughs> tool that um, is gender neutral and very inviting for any and all circumstances. Um, we have 350,000 users in 36 countries. We have an iteration in India. We were on 10 college campuses. We are building out now an encrypted version for women journalists in Mexico who face um, the highest levels of violence doing journalism work. So they need to be connected, they need to safety plan, they need to trust the technology. Um, and it's a very small but move growing field of like survivor-led tech because a lot of the technology was like, oh, panic button, hit a button, you know, go right to the police. Yeah. I was like, okay, my app is never linking you to the police as a default because you're probably underage and you're probably drinking. You know, and all the military populations that use the tool are like, we do not want, we don't, we're not supposed to be, what's the word when they're mixing? Fraternizing. Co fraternizing. I was like, it's not fornicating, but it probably is. Um, <laughs> Code for. It's like that. Yes, one foot um, on the floor. Right. So, so it's just it's about peer to peer engagement, which is which is sort of how young people learn about sex and support each other anyway. So I wonder if it'd be useful for for your community too. We can That's talk what about I that. was thinking. That'd yeah. be an amazing tool. Definitely. Awesome. Let's talk. Yes. And <laughs> right, the free. platform is built. You yeah. know, just uh, adapted. It's amazing. And yeah. that's yeah. The, the, with technology. It seems to me that given the um, limited amount of support we're receiving from our state and local, our, our um, state local and federal governments that it really is up to each community and to creative people uh, and technologists to, to provide a lot of the service that is necessary. Um, I'm going to ask one more question and then we're going to go uh, to the panel and then we're going to go to questions from the audience. But if you, and, and this is, you know, the magic wand question. If tomorrow 
you could solve one aspect of this issue and you had the power to do it, what would it be and how would you do it? There'd be unlimited funding in terms of hard dollars <laughs> for all sexual assault survivors to pursue justice if they so desired and um, the money, we can easily get it from the defense budget. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> yeah. or, or, the, or the whole space thing, right? <laughs> All right. The space force. Um, so I, I'm, I'm too stuck in my head as an, as an activist to um, think that I could ma wave the wand. Um, what I'm trying to do at my alma mater and, and throughout higher education is to reshape the way that we look at this issue uh, as, a, as an education issue. What is the role of education, not only for sex ed, but, um, but also in engaging men in, in, a, in a positive and proactive way and moving away from the activism model and more to an education model. And, and really talking about um, you know, what, what, the, what the app does is create that circle. Well, there's circles of men constantly who are um, creating a culture where, where we encourage certain kinds of behavior independent of women and, and penetrating that culture and penetrating the culture of men so that we are starting to talk to men and men are engaged and see that there is something for us in this conversation. How does that happen? I mean, wh where? So it, through public education, obviously there would be many people left out of that. How do we really infiltrate this message into, the, into society? It's, it's I don't think, and this is why I brought up the billion dollar problem earlier. I don't think that we have a choice. And the men that are in this room and the men that want to be part of the solution, it is time for us to start talking about the honesty of how we were raised as boys to look at our, our own masculinity. Not how we look at our masculinity as it relates to women, but how we have been raised to look at our masculinity and see that as fundamental to, to this conversation. And so, um, I, when, years ago when I first started doing this work, the first thing that came to my mind was how I was raised to, to look at my masculinity. And it was with that, that I always ask men, the worst insult you ever heard as a little boy. The insult that, that drove you to work harder, that drove you to, to not be you know, ashamed of, of your being. It was you throw like a girl, or you run like a girl, or anything related to My mother to told me that the other day, I couldn't believe it. <laughs> exactly, and, and the two messages that boys get simultaneously, one is that, that um, women and girls are less than. Right, because it would not be an insult, it would not be a charge. Right. Um, so fundamentally learning that women and girls are less than. I always say that, that our mothers are, are often the first woman that we're taught to see as less than. And, and so that leads to the, the proponents of violence against women. But this other piece that boys learn is that, that being a man is this very narrowly prescribed uh, um, set of, of, of identities. Be tough, be strong, don't cry, don't show your emotion. And that we live by that narrowness, and some people call it toxic masculinity, and I don't, I don't call it the toxicity of masculinity, I call it the toxicity of masculinity, but not toxic masculinity, because that narrowness is the narrowness that defined me. And I was privileged because of that. I was privileged as a football player, even as a black man. I'm writing a book, my first uh, chapter is titled Black Man with Privilege. And the privilege was my masculinity. Yeah. And so, and as long as I maintained the narrowness of that masculinity, I was okay. And there's a blind spot to that. There's a blind spot to men who aren't taking care of themselves. There's a blind spot to men who aren't taking care of the people in, in, in their circle. There's a blind spot to where we are in this billion dollar problem of men not having an honest conversation. And that's a, that's a conversation that we as men need to have with each other. Great, thanks. Nancy? Oh. Oh. I like that money thing. <laughs> um, but I guess it's a little, kind of a combination of, um, you know, as a woman in the film industry and somewhat in the tech industry, it's like our stuff is so siloed. And first of all, I'm tired. <laughs> like I, my, my dream, if I had the wand, it would be like, let's go to the beach and let the guys do this work sort it now. Out. Like, you got a lot of work to do, Todd. <laughs> you don't have to be the only <laughs> one, but like I'm done. Like we're done, like we've done that, you know, and it's great and I do think that's changing and that's actually what I wanna do with this film is engage athletes, engage men. I don't need to lead this conversation. I, it'll be fun to go talk to the New York Giants, you know, but I need someone like you or I need someone like Wade Davis, a football player, a man, to like do that work, right? So, there's a, so if I could wave the wand, it was like women can go do other stuff that they feel like doing instead of like surviving assaults and then teaching the world about how shitty it is. And like, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. <laughs> I 
Perfect. <laughs> Done. Okay. And and I just want to commend can I commend you too for for your bravery and for for really managing to move the needle and then and that you are willing to participate in that conversation and make a difference and without people like you there is no hope that this will happen and I know there are lots of people like them in the audience and so we really want to make sure that that message is out there and everything you do makes a difference if you see something say something, mm -hmm. um, or, or lend a hand or an ear. Um, and we will provide some of the, um, the information that we talked about with the apps and, and everything else later on and some community groups that are helping. But in the meantime, let's, let's go to the audience. Um, I'm sure that there are lots of questions. What a, what a nice room. <laughs> I know. <laughs> she said Tom the hadn't seen this yet. This is a cool spot. OK. All right. How about this, this gentleman um, right here in the blue shirt? Thank you all very much. Really informative. Don, I'm thrilled that you're here because having tried to attend a lot of these over the past couple years, um, there are very few men on the panels. So I agree with you that this is a men's issue. And I'm curious what you find. What is the most concise in your experience of trying to educate adults or at least college kids? Because you said you're working at the university level. Is there one message that you have found the most powerful for kind of, it's, it's very hard to re-educate people. Mm -hmm. And I have this naive um, belief that simply having heard from so many women how scarring even things to use Torah's scale are, are perhaps on the minor side, that even those minor actions are really scarring for women in a way that frankly I didn't know and I thought of myself as enlightened. So to me, I kind of think if people simply could hear that, that would do it. But I wonder what you're actually finding in practice is most powerful for getting men to change behavior. So as I said earlier, the, the, I, I've been doing this for a very long time. And, and uh, like Nancy, I'm, I'm tired. And, um, and tired of trying to have to convince men that there's a problem. And many years ago, that was it. If I spent an hour with a, with a group of men, I would spend the first 35, 40 minutes convincing them of the problem. So using all sorts of examples uh, and analogies to try to help them understand the problem. But it's very hard for men to understand that problem. Um, and so um, that's why I said that we have to get to this conversation. And it's not a conversation that, that's going to be welcomed, that we're now talking to men about healthy masculinity, and that's the, that's the solution. Um, but I, the title of my book has been You Throw Like a Girl for many years, and now I, I'm, I'm sort of changing it to The Blind Spot of Masculinity and The Blind Spot of Privilege. And I'll tell you, um, uh, uh, and I'm going to talk to two football teams in the next couple of weeks at Ithaca College and UCLA, and the first thing I'm going to tell them is about a guy named Chris Gedney. Chris Gedney, who played football at Syracuse, was an All-American, um, white guy from Syracuse, All-American at Syracuse, played in the NFL, making great money. He was a senior associate athletics director at Syracuse University doing radio for the football team on Saturday afternoons, living the life. If you talk to Chris Gedney every day, Chris, how you doing? Living the dream, man, living the dream. Three months ago, Chris Gedney put a shotgun to his head and killed himself. He wasn't living the dream. He was living a nightmare, and the nightmare was rooted in his privilege. The same thing that, made, that gave him privilege and made him a warrior made him weak. And so he didn't know how to ask for help. He didn't know how to seek help. And by the way, the privilege that we often say, that there's white privilege or male privilege, that we often say from the outside, this is the blind spot of that privilege, is that nobody around him, all the people who saw this man in decline, all said, what could possibly be wrong with him? He's got everything going for him. And so that blind spot of masculinity, that blind spot of privilege that allows men to get away with this culture, to get away with the violence that's going on, and not realizing how that hurts us as well. How that hurts the psyche of our culture. The psyche of the culture, we, we haven't talked about it, but when we have a president who says, grab her in the pussy, and that's America? The psyche of our culture that allows that to be the case. Men need to understand how that hurts us as well, how that hurts us in our families, how that hurts us individually, and how it hurts the, the culture that we raise our children in. So I would tell you that, that I think the thing that is, when we as men can see how we are damaged by this, uh, unfortunately, it takes, I, it drives me crazy when I hear a man say, oh, I care about this now because I have a daughter. Right? What does that say to, by the way, what does that say to his wife? <laughs> um, we as men have to see that, that, that this is our issue primarily. Thanks. 
Oh my gosh, ladies, raise your hand. Here we go. <laughs> She's got notes. Joined the board of the retreat a couple of months ago. I want you to know out in our small town, all of our schools, all the way to Hapag, are begging to come in and offer educational programs. So we're like so, every waking moment, they're, they're going into our local schools to teach the kids the new rules, what a healthy relationship is. So it's happening in our town. The more money we have, the more we can offer. Um, also, um, men are abused too. So I think we should not always just say men abusing women. Yes, absolutely. And acknowledge the fact that it's humans being abused, or people, or whatever the sure. correct term. Sure. Absolutely. Oh, one there, and then you'll be next. Okay. Could I follow up on the um, funding for the pursuit of justice uh, comment? Um, as among the interesting issues that's been raised by the Me Too movement is the question of how how is justice administered? So, for example, um, we have these outmoded concepts like you know presumed innocent or uh, um, preponderance of evidence or uh, Beyond, uh, or guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. In universities, it's, uh, due process means something different. How do you think the rules should change? Uh, uh, as a disclaimer, I believe they should change, but I just don't know what they are yet. Uh, how do you That's think rules should change to make people more comfortable or to facilitate the pursuit of justice? Um, so I have two ideas. I love that question. That's a, are you a lawyer? Yes. Oh, that's them. I can hear it. Um, well, you know, it's interesting. Um, when you try a case by a jury, right? And I used to do this education with my first film 10 years ago, or eight years ago. And you're basically asking eight people who don't understand trauma and how trauma works. Like trauma blocks memory. Memories come out in pieces. Trauma makes things nonlinear. Children should not be asked to do certain things. Refugees are asked to remember your story. Oh, she was inconsistent. Like there's a lack of understanding about how trauma works. So this idea that we can have juries who have so little understanding of what rape myths are, how um, biases work, and also how trauma works is just kind of setting things up for failure. Um, so whether that means there's a panel, look, it's all very imperfect, right? But if there is a panel of people who have experience with trauma and public health and neural damage and rape, you know, maybe weighing in on cases instead of asking your average person who doesn't really know anything except what they've seen on Law and Order, which thank God isn't the worst show in the world. Um, it's not the best, but like they've done work, but like they're, they're getting their ideas of how the court system works from television. So one thing would be to really question and shake up the idea of juries and make sure there are people who know how this stuff works. The other piece, there's um, movements called transformational or restorative justice, which go um, outside of the criminal justice system that are more victim focused, victim centered and community focused. So in my case, I didn't go to the police because I was in a foreign country, but I worked with a lot of international people who had done the Truth and Reconciliation Commissions in South Africa. Like, how do you heal a civil war context? Like, how do you heal when, you know, your neighbor was doing these terrible things and now we have to live next to each other? Like, what do we do? They're all, they're imperfect processes, but what I learned from that was it was so empowering as a victim to say, well, it's all, what do you, what do you need? Like, what happened? A, to even be asked, like, what was lost for you? How much money did you spend on therapy? Um, what did you lose? What things did you stop doing? What jobs didn't you keep? Um, is that a number tally? Do you want you know, financial rec compensation or you just wanna be heard? I actually wanted to meet with my offender in a space that didn't tell him to deny everything. So when you go into court with someone, the lawyer saying deny this, deny this, cop to this, say you didn't do that. So for the victim to hear their abuser say, nope, didn't do it, nope, 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 is so painful when actually what I wanted to hear was this person just admit it. 
But our system is set up so that this person is not going to admit it because then they're going to get punished even years later. So I think if, if we could listen to survivors and victims about what feels holistic for them, I want to face this person in a safe way. I want them to hear me. I want the community around us to hear how I was impacted. I want them to try to understand, and I want compensation. Do I want this person behind bars? I don't know. That depends. Um, yeah. You know, that, that depends. But I think just like our black and white, I, I think there's ways to look at transformational justice that, that do better things for victims. Tori, you had something. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, so um, all the points that you made, yes, and along with that, I just wanted to be believed by the criminal justice system. One of my detectives um, in the Wisconsin case closed out my case and didn't even conduct due process, didn't investigate my uncle. And to date, it's been over two years, has not informed me that he unilaterally closed out the case. Now the question is, where was the DA involved in that? Why did the DA not follow up and say, what happened with this case? Um, t to me, a solution would be for there to be some sort of liaison, independent liaison, who's there to help the victims through that first step. Like while they're going through trying to get, um, you know, talking to the detective and trying to get the case uh, uh, to the point where it goes to into the system, you know, we need that help because as a survivor or victim, I'm re-traumatized when I'm not believed, and, and I'm questioned. And um, another aspect to that is uh, in terms of just the, the, the general sort of, uh, well, I would say yes, how you were saying that there, there should be more people involved in the process who understand the, the trauma, that aspect of it, how that really works. Um, but yeah, I have other, other thoughts on it. That's kind of the main idea is. <laughs> hey, thanks. Question down here. Um, so a movie that really impacted me when I was younger was Miss Congeniality. So there's the scene where, you know, she's like trying to come up with something and she's like, I'll just teach women how to have self-defense. So I kind of have gone about in the world with this very touch me and I'll break your arm kind of <laughs> mentality. And I'm, I'm thinking now, maybe that's not really the best way because that's kind of just fighting violence with violence. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious to um, give you guys a very black and white question. Let's say time and money is always the biggest thing. You had $10 million in 50 hours. Based on your experience, would you spend more time talking with men or with women? What do you think is gonna make the greater impact in making a real change? Talking to men, 100,000 <laughs> million percent. I would say women go to the beach. We'll, we'll, cool. we'll, yeah. Give Don See the $10 million. <laughs> right. I'll take, yeah, I'll take the $10 million and women can go to the beach. I'll take the $10 million. That sounds like a great plan. <laughs> no, I, Nancy and Tori will take a million each and then you can take the other. 50-50. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but that comes up actually in, in my film a bit. There are two girls in the student mill film who say some things and I put them in there to show how women uphold rape culture too by policing other women, well, she put herself in that situation and she, you know, all that stuff. And some people in the Q&A are like, I'm glad you had that perspective, but that's important. Girls need to know. And I'm like, I will never focus my energy telling girls how to behave differently, um, how to not be empowered, how to not get to do all the fun things that everyone else gets to do. And that's the tool that I built was never about why is a girl out late at night by herself drunk? And like, right. like every other college student in America. That, Seriously, so it's, yeah. That's the point that you made earlier the, 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 that I said in your film was that we raise girls to survive in a rape culture. I was, told you I was a father, son of a, a New York City cop and, and I heard him tell my daughters, uh, excuse me, his daughters, my sisters, all the things they had to do to protect themselves. I refer to it as the, the list, right? If you ask men in this room, what do you do on a daily basis to protect yourself from being sexually assaulted, sexually harassed or raped? We might sit there and go, I don't know, I don't know, what do you mean? Right? But women, it's all those things that we tell women to do and we've been telling and raising women to do. Watch your drink, well, park in a well-lit place, don't, don't get an apartment on the first floor. Right? All the different things that, that uh, carry, use your keys as a weapon, carry mace, carry purpose space, take self-defense courses. I remember many, many years ago when I was living in Philadelphia, um, a, a woman I was dating came to my house and, and she was in law school at Temple in North, North Philly and she, 
she had a little bag and the bag was in the, in the bedroom and I went to move the bag and there were bullets oh, in the bag, right? And I said, you know, when do you bring that topic up, right? <laughs> and, I, and very gingerly, you know, later on, I'm like, hey, uh, I noticed some, some bullets. <laughs> and I said, what's with the bullets? She said, they're for the gun. <laughs> and her father had given question. her a gun because she was in law school at Temple. If that's what it takes for our, our daughters to go to college and go to law school, if they have to be armed, we are in a depraved culture. Tori, did you want to comment? Uh, I don't like the black and white question. <laughs> it's especially in my specific context, having grown up in, in a community that um, it, it's, it's the woman's fault and my mother didn't stand up for me. None of the women in my community stood up for me, fought for me. In fact, there's no female in any leadership position in the Amish, and this has been over 300 years. Yeah, and it's not, and it's not the only community where that's exactly. the case. Exactly, yeah. So in my, from, based on my personal experience, women have equal responsibility in this. Thanks. Following up on Don's point, and I know Don's work for many years now, he's really terrific, and this has been really a very good discussion. But following up on his point, women protect themselves in so many ways that are not even realized. As we look at the four of you, all three women have crossed legs at the knees. The man has the freedom Freedom to just relax and sit any way he wants. <laughs> and I'm very obsessed these days with legs apart no, and legs no together. <laughs> and it's Done. fascinating how <laughs> this starts at the micro level. And women have learned to protect themselves while men have a freedom of movement. <laughs> yes, ma'am. <laughs> We have time for two more. I know when not to respond. <laughs> uh, this is a, a two-part question. Uh, the first part you've sort of partly answered, but I was wondering, this is uh, for, for Tara, if there's something about closed communities, and I know you already said women don't have any leadership roles, but what other aspects of closed communities do you think actually foster sexual abuse? So that's like the first part of the question. And the second part is, um, in terms of the, the Amish community, um, have you had any um, relation, uh, relationships with any of the Hasidic or ultra-Orthodox communities? And what, you know, that's also another closed community. And in terms of, of uh, sexual abuse issues in that community, and so have you, is your work you know, included, you know, that, that contact and connection. Thank you. Yes, so I'll, I'll start with the last question first, which is the ultra-Orthodox Jewish community. Um, I actually have some very good friends over there and first learned about Footsteps, um, which is their nonprofit doing exactly what my nonprofit is doing or, you know, modeling after. So I have uh, some good support from them. And in terms of, of the the cultural attitudes and issues and challenges, it's pretty much um, a mirror um, of what is going on inside the Amish. And then uh, your other question was, what fosters the sexual abuse in closed, in closed communities? I would say it, it, it's when women are relegated to second class status, that they're not equal to men, and, and it's not, um, it's actually enforced, you know, so I know in mainstream society, we still don't have equal status as women. We don't have equal pay, for example, uh, but inside the closed communities and in the Amish specifically, you are required to obey your husband. You are um, required to uh, do whatever pleases your husband. You really don't have any say at all. and. That, that is, I mean, if that's what you are taught in order to get to heaven, maybe, <laughs> then 
of course, if the husband's abusing you or something happens, I mean, if you're told to just look the other way, it just, it doesn't help. Um, I would say just even in the town that I was in, which is not closed and, you know, it's 50 minutes from Pittsburgh, um, I went to being the dutiful documentary filmmaker, um, city council meetings, games, I went to all these community events, there were no women in leadership anywhere. And this is, this is open, public school. There was a superintendent who replaced the one that was indicted, um, that was a woman. Um, it is, there's not a woman on the football field, obviously. Football is not a sport played by women. There were no women in leadership at city council. People still use the term town fathers. And I was like, and you wonder why there's a big problem here. Yeah. Okay, one more. This gentleman in the, the Navy sweater has had his hand up a lot. <laughs> Uh, I guess this question is mostly for Donald. <clears throat> Given the level of violence in the world, um, which I guess in some way seems necessary, uh, can't we really look at this problem of, of rape as a violence issue? And maybe I need an answer to this. Can't we teach our kids instead of physical violence, in most cases, cooperation, and somehow separate this ability to compete and be big and be real from the issue of physical violence. Um, I, think, I think I understand um, the question, and um, I think we also have to understand rape in, in a different way, that it is, it is, is a violent act, it is not a sex act, and it is violent, however, and this goes back to my point earlier about where young men are learning about sexual behavior. If, if my only framework of understanding sexual behavior is from violent misogynistic porn, that to me is intimacy. And when it appears that women in, in pornography are complicit with this kind of male behavior, this is why, why, one of the reasons why I have a problem with the concept of consent, because all consent is, is one first thing it does is put, puts the responsibility of women, women to meet out intimacy, right? So I have to get permission from her to do that which I was going to do anyway, or that I understood sex to be. And so consent, all consent does is give me permission to do that thing I was going to do. And, and what pornography is now, those of you who don't, um, you know, when I ask men, if you didn't get it from your parents, where'd you get it from? It would take me a little time for them to come around to, I learned about sex and, and learned about women and women's bodies from pornography. And years ago, it, it, I'd have to work them towards saying, oh, the internet, internet porn. Now they say the hub. Right, do you know what porn, the hub is porn hub. And it's so common a young, amongst young men that that's where they're learning. And Pornhub is rape by category. If you've never seen it, go to it and check it out. And I used to, years ago, I used to tell parents, tape yourself down, duct tape yourself, and watch MTV because I wanted them to know what their children were consuming. Now I say, tape yourself down and, and go to the internet and search the word sex and find out what eight, nine, ten-year-old boys are watching on a regular basis. It is rape. And to them, it's normal. And so, and them, they think that's sex. And, and if you think that I'm making this up, please have, start having honest conversations with young people and start listening. And let's not clutch our pearls like this is something new, right? And recognize that this has been going on. And so, you know, we've normalized the, the, the violence. We celebrate the violence in, in, our, in our culture. And, and so, um, we have a tremendous job to do um, recognizing that most of that violence, and we, and we even celebrate women's empowerment by women who are violent, right? Like Wonder Woman. Wonder Woman's awesome. But Wonder Woman's appealing across the board because she's also violent. And so we have a tremendous job to do to teach loving, caring humanity in, in our culture. And that, and I remember years ago, a colleague of mine, you know, we were at war, and she says, how do we, how grotesque is it that we're trying to talk about violence prevention? I once did a, did a, 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 a sexual violence prevention presentation in Minot, North Dakota, at the military base, at the Air Force, Air Force Base in Minot, an Air Force Base within, 300, within, within a, a, a three mile radius of the Air Force Base with 300 armed nuclear weapons. 
that could destroy the world. And I was there to talk to them about violence prevention. <laughs> right? And so there's a, there's a dissonance that we have, have to overcome in, in, in our culture of how normalized violence is and, and how linked it is to sexuality, especially for young men. I'm going to sneak in one more. The lady in the back. Enjoyed this so much. Um, Don, uh, since uh, higher ed, it is, there's been such a, a tremendous problem on college campuses, and uh, you spend a lot of time on, uh, in higher ed. So if Michigan's, Michigan and Penn State and Baylor are examples of Michigan how, State, just want to get that right. I'm sorry, Michigan State, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, were examples of uh, campuses that have done it wrong. And, could you tell us what the leadership could have done to make to do it right? Or, on the other hand, to say, are there campuses where leadership has done it right on the college campus to uh, create a culture that is um, doesn't um, doesn't uh, tolerate this kind of behavior? Okay, uh, I, I would like to lobby for this gentleman to have his answer, his question. Um, he's had his hand up, and, and um, but I but I, I just want to lobby for him in, in, on behalf of time. I know it's getting late, but um, I, I, this gentleman's had his hand up from the very beginning. Um, and you had that is that turquoise shirt on that that you stand out and he's yeah, right in yeah, he's right in my line of sight. Um, so I would say that, and I, I spent the last um, ten months doing an analysis on not just on my campus at Syracuse University, but um, in higher ed as a whole, and we do it wrong. Completely. We have this billion dollar problem uh, that beyond those three institutions, there are, there at one point, I guess there were 220 open OCR investigations um, of Title IX violations um, by the Office of Civil Rights uh, at, at the time before the, this recent administration took office and then kind of squashed much, much of that, that work. And so you have a, a, a huge number of institutions that are dealing with this problem. So we have this billion dollar problem that we've always known that, ex that, that exists and Here's what we do on college campuses. Student-led activism, take back the night, white ribbon campaign, but still, it's pure education. Kids don't know. We, we have, we're asking students to talk to each other about things that they really don't know how to talk about because the adults don't want to talk about it. You have overwhelmed and understaffed offices. For example, I shouldn't, I shouldn't talk about any one institution, but I've already named my own, um, that have this major problem, schools with, with 15, 20, 30,000 students, and there's two people in the office that, that are doing this work. Right, we have, we have, we have an IT person in every department. We have an IT person in, in every college, in every department. We have the IT here, then we have IT in every little, because God forbid a computer should go, go bad. And I always say to people, well, when was the last time a computer was charged with sexual assault? So we should have the same amount of, of resources uh, spread across campus, having a proactive, and if we want excellence, in every other place that we want excellence in our lives, that we want young people to live in, in, in a world of excellence, we should be teaching it. If we want excellence in the classroom, we teach it. If we want excellence in the theater, we rehearse, we teach. When it comes to this issue that we don't want to talk about, we let students do it, or we let some outside agency, somebody like me comes in and talks for an hour on your campus. That's not the solution. And so we have to be proactive about it, we have to use the things, utilize the models that we know, that, that students get better, and we have, to, we have to resolve the dissonance of male behavior that we have ignored for so long, especially in higher education. Brock Turner was a, a swimmer at Stanford. Olympic quality swimmer, Stanford University student. All kinds of privilege, all kinds of, uh, of recognition that he wasn't just privileged, he worked for it. And he raped an unconscious woman behind a dumpster. Where is the dissonance in our culture that says, where are we letting boys down to the point that they are hurting women to this extent? And so our institutions have to look at this completely as an issue of education and not of activism, where we, where we have a month, by the way, we do sexual assault awareness month on college campuses in April. Really, April, when the student's about to graduate or leave for the summer for four months? That's when we do awareness? And so we have to do a better job on campuses to look at this as an education issue and not an activism issue. And it's, a, um, yeah. um, it's also a CYA issue. Yeah. Cover your ass. So I worked on a bunch of campuses with Circle of Six, an app that's been proven to reduce, and I'm like offering it for very little money. And what do they have on campuses? Blue light boxes. Oh, because I'm going to go on a date in front of a blue light box. 
Um, I had my university, Columbia University, tell me um, when I presented the app to them, and we, we had nine partners. I'll tell you one school that did it right and did it really smart. Um, literally say, but what about the student at Columbia where I think tuition's $100,000 a year? What about the student that doesn't have a smartphone? I was like, what about that student? Find me that student, A. B, if there is that student, you, Columbia, buy them a smartphone <laughs> and just stop. So there's just a massive level of just, I love the, the laughter, because I was like, I'm trying not to laugh in your face, but you have a woman carrying a mattress around on national media about your problems, and you don't want to put a tech tool to test. So Williams did it well, because instead of what the CYA, most schools do, is hire, they took their little tiny bit of money for their two staff people, $100,000, $150,000 to put towards prevention. They hired lawyers who were Title IX compliant lawyers. So all that did was take away any education, any education, first month of school. Um, I tried to, oh, you should play my film. Don and I can go talk. And they said, well, we have 45 minutes at the beginning of school, and we have to talk about binge drinking, suicide, and rape. So we don't, oh, that's all we have. So education is 45 minutes. They got rid of that. They get the lawyer who's just teach, telling the school to be compliant, right? So the one school that's doing it well is they hired a prevention director. It's a much smaller school. She has training in, in education and violence prevention. She rolled out Circle of Six all year, did focus groups at the beginning of the year, at the end of the year. Kids were intervening on situations that looked uncomfortable for kids they didn't even know. So it starts out in a small circle, and if you teach around it suddenly, and they weren't Girls were tweeting about that on Yik Yak, which is a campus thing people do. She said, oh, whoever that guy was, I really appreciate it. Thanks for cutting in. So you can shift the culture if you check in with your students every three months, if you do programs not just in April, not just in September, but throughout the year, and you hire people that know what they're doing, and you prioritize it. So they're still in their like little legal CYA situation, which isn't helping because they're still paying out millions of dollars, and someone is still making tons of money on those blue light boxes. Um, yeah. <laughs> the gentleman in the turquoise. We do have to be somewhat brief. My real question is this. I've been hearing about the ju judicial system, the educational system, uh, culture, the churches, all being responsible and that maybe if a lot of money was pumped in to help them, that we might somehow relieve the problem. There is an elephant in the room that we all seem not to be addressing, and that's biology. In other words, to what extent, if we did all that money and did all that education, would this problem not go away? Because it is basically built into our genes. So, um... Aren't you glad you took that question? No, I, <laughs> listen, let me, let, me, let, me, let me just say this, because it, it's, it's, it's a, um, you know, I remember being at a conference once and, and I got a question even like more Ooh, than that, right? They made people uncomfortable. And it, that is a, 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 a very important question. And it's an important question because there are other people in the room who may be thinking the same thing. But it's a very important question that, that, that you're thinking as a man in, in, in our culture is sort of that, well, isn't this just, you know, men are the dominant species and, and um, it was supposed to be bigger and stronger and all those things. And, and th those are, that's an important question because it is at the core of our inability to have the important conversation. And then I can agree with you, right? I'm the biggest person up here. I'm, I'm spreading my legs and all those things, right? And, and at what point, and at what point as a man, if I had this power and this privilege, at what point do I understand that, that my power and my privilege comes from the oppression of my sisters. My power and privilege comes from the oppression of them. And therefore, it's not truly mine. And at what point do we as men live in a world where, because I'm bigger and stronger, and, and physically bigger and stronger, and because um, of my biology, that I get to ignore what's happening to the people around me? I don't personally want to live in that world, right? That's the world that we're, we're in now. And so it's an argument. It's an argument, and, and, and this is the part, I think, to Nancy's point a moment ago, it's an argument that we better get comfortable with the argument 
right? We better get comfortable as a, as a nation because we are going to have, and we're going through this right now, a lot of reconciliation to come back to where we are in our humanity and, and, and the difficult conversations that we need to have. I mean, you actually have people who are saying um, that I'd, I'd, rather be, I'd rather be a Russian than a Democrat. Right, we're having this, no, I'm serious, we're having this, 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 this erosion of our civility and we're, and we're calling it patriotism or we're calling it my place and, my, and at some point we're going to have to get, have a conversation that moves us past the fundamental because I am this, I get to be that. And we have to find a way to help um, as a society and to help our children to be able to have that conversation. So I, I take that and let's, let's go have a beer and talk about that. Um. Well, I just want to say from a zoological perspective, um, if you want to think about two very, so killer whales are matrilineal. So if you want to look at other structures of um, community and family power, it is all run by grandmas, and those are the biggest motherfuckers in the ocean. <laughs> and then if you're on land, another mammal, nasty fighters that you do not want to get caught up in hyenas are matrilineal. So it's interesting because sometimes we all think we're so stuck in our thing of this is how it has to be and like man, you know, patriarchy and oh the bonobos, the good chimps. I don't know if you guys know about bonobos, but that's like a whole other, <laughs> a whole other discussion. That's a whole other conversation. Because like they get co-opted into another community, but um polyamorous uh, people talk about them. But um but from a non-polyamorous bonobo perspective, it's interesting to look at how other mammals function, right, in a more peace-building way, in a more cooperative way, to your point about cooperation. Still using power. Killer whales are huge. Hyenas are insane hunters, but they're matrilineal, so that's just something else to look at. All these years, I didn't know your depth of, of <laughs> zoological knowledge. <laughs> Tora. Pretty fascinating. Yeah. Tora. I'm going to throw in my two cents, and that would be, um, I would like to think that men would start to work on developing more compassion and empathy, perhaps like from a biological standpoint, women tend to be more empathetic. <laughs> so maybe with all this education and awareness raising, men can evolve. <laughs> maybe. There is so. On that very cheery note. <laughs> Thank you uh, to the panel. And clearly, like I said at the top, that the, the conversation needs to be had until we don't have to have it anymore. And I really appreciate your furthering it. And I hope that you guys take it home and you keep it going. And I also want to thank, um, in addition to these wonderful panelists, our sponsors who made all this possible. And I hope that you'll all join us next week for the opioid conversation. <laughs>